thank you all very much for setting aside this block of time on a Monday evening. I want to introduce you to a really cool guy, uh, Tom Clough, and I'm delighted that Tom can help interpret the results of this survey for us because he has such an extensive experience working with churches in New England of many different sizes, uh, many different sensibilities, and uh, has a a deft and thoughtful and wise hand in the way he goes about it. Well, it's good to be with you this evening. I am stranger to all but two on the screen tonight. Uh, and I'll tell you, they don't come much stranger uh, than me. I have no idea what Salisbury is really like. All I know about you is what I've read that you said about yourselves in the Vital Signs Report. I hope I can be helpful tonight. I do not, though, present myself as an expert on what Salisbury ought to do to make the world a better place. That's your job. What I would like to do tonight is to explain, interpret a report that has been compiled as a result of your efforts. The reason I'm doing this and the reason I've so strangely requested that you not read the report in advance, which is what you usually do when you go to a meeting, you get yourself prepared for it. Uh, it has been the experience of thousands of churches that there's something about the way this report has been compiled that it can confuse instead of illuminate if uh, you don't have someone every once in a while pointing out just how awkwardly presented this is and how it doesn't really mean what it seems to say. It is my hope tonight that the hour and a half or two hours that we spend will help you to make better decisions and perhaps will give you insights into the way your congregation operates, in particular uh, in comparison with many other congregations. So what we're gonna be talking about tonight is not my idea of what's going on there. It's what you said when you put together this report. It is a compilation of the 56, I'm sorry, 68 uh, different people's responses. But my hope is that you will at some point say, not holy cow, but that really does sound like our church, even though it is, doesn't, may not quite agree with everything that I put on the report. One of the huge challenges in a congregation is that church people are nice most of the time. Uh, and that usually means in New England that you stifle your disagreement and smile and shake the pastor's hand and say, nice sermon, even when it's music Sunday and there wasn't a sermon uh, that has happened. So this is an opportunity, and it's, I think it's fairly rare in congregational life that we take the time to organize an opportunity to state your opinions on a number of very important issues in the life of the church. What you've got before you is a, rep a report that is, I think it has two major values for church members. The first one is that it's a survey that somebody else made up. This is a survey that's been tried out for years, and when I finally did hear about it about nine years ago, I became deeply religious and grateful to God for the creation of this, because I really do think that it doesn't set anybody up in the congregation. It doesn't come in with any set agenda. It really does ask a bunch of important questions and get some good information. And it breaks that information in this report down into three parts. The first part asks you basically, how are you feeling? It asks you, what would you like to be doing more of? And so you get a sense, I think, similar to what you get when you go to the doctor for an annual physical. You get a sense of how things are going. You go in hoping it's not going to reveal disastrous things. You walk out saying, I could have told him that, okay? So that survey has benefit and you could do that if you wanted to take the time. But the other thing that it includes is 
a benchmarking of your responses with the responses of 2,000 churches that have, within the past five years, used this particular tool. 2,000 mainline churches, 2,000 churches that would you'd feel comfortable going into, even if they are Presbyterians or American Baptists or Episcopalians. Uh, I think that's something that makes it possible to say, this is how we feel. And as a church, what does that mean? How does that compare not to political parties or parent teacher organizations, but how does that compare to these strange creatures that call themselves churches? And I think that is a major value in this exercise that we're going to be taking a look at. They use terms in that first part called drivers. And I don't know why they came up with that. It's basically, what do you care about? Uh, and we're gonna take a look at that. And we're also gonna take a look at what, what do you wish and dream about? The second part, which is actually a fairly short part, but I think sometimes it's the most illuminating part of the whole report. It's called the descriptive indices. They're indexes, and there are a series of indexes throughout indices throughout this report. But these are the ones that sort of describe to you what your style appears to be compared to other churches. You are the Congregational Church of Salisbury. If you needed to describe that to someone, how would you describe it? And this might be helpful, these descriptive indices. And they do, I think, uh, really particularly describe what Salisbury has to offer in the congregational tradition. And finally, there are sort of the report card section that the report card questions, indices that measure how you feel about things like the worship life, the music life, how you feel about the educational programming, how you feel about the way decisions are made in this congregation. And it's a range of measurements that you have given to yourself and they're just compiled in a report form that I will try to explain. We are now at the point where we are ready to open the mystery envelope. And we'll start on page four. Page four is, if uh, someone mentioned they had to leave early, this is in a way a summary of the whole report. Uh, this is when I get the report from uh, Holy Cow, it's the page I immediately go to to check out the first two items on that page, which are also informative. It has been found to be remarkably revelatory if you get a sense of how people are feeling as far as are they satisfied. On the whole, I am satisfied with how things are in our church. You all, I believe, if you all present did, were indeed among those who participated, uh, the overall satisfaction 59% of you were either in agreement or strongly agreeing. That's about two thirds of the congregation feels that they clearly agree that they are satisfied. Another third of the congregation are on the fence. They either mildly agree or mildly disagree. And that's an important group for you to be paying attention to. It is, this is not an election. Uh, it isn't just key how many clearly agree and how many disagree. That group on the fence does tell you where your church is at this point. And as church leaders, you can see here that with a third of the congregation saying, well, let me think about that one. Uh, you have a group that can very much listen to your thoughts that come out of the committee meetings and the thoughts that come out of the search committee meeting. This is a group that is wondering and ready to be convinced one way or another, probably care immensely, but just don't have enough information at this point. So that on the fence group is sizable for a church, but it is actually good news. It means that 
if you need to be flexible, this is a church that is open to considering both sides of issues. And as far as clearly disagree, that would be someone who says, I am not satisfied the way things are in our church. It's 7%. Now, how does that measure up with other churches? The rating of your church's satisfaction level, it's normal. You are a church that attracts people from a town and they may come to the church not because you're saying the right things, they may come because it's their church in their town. And so you'll get a range of opinions. Here, the fact that you have almost two thirds satisfied at this point, we'll take a look in a moment or two, uh, but that, that says a lot uh, and it opens up some possibilities that we can be celebrating in a couple of minutes. Matter of fact, let's turn to page five just for a moment and see where that figure came from, what's going on in the congregation. And this is something that has been pulled out of the data, what they call drivers, or what is it that people care about in this congregation that makes a difference as to whether they feel satisfied with the way things are going or not. Uh, there may not be a large driver component for those who care about stamp collecting. That doesn't seem to come to the surface in this congregation. Very seldom does it, so they haven't even included it as one of the questions. But there are some things that do come to the surface that members of this congregation focus on. And if they're going the way they want them to go, then they would give you a, an enthusiastic satisfaction rating. They care about these items. Now, the drivers as they're listed, this is maybe the only reason you need to listen to me tonight. This does not give you the highest scoring drivers. We'll find out later how you actually rate yourself on these. But these are the ones where your congregation has made it clear that you really care about these particular items more than any others in the whole survey. These are the ones that got the greatest number of strongly disagrees or strongly agrees. And that is a very important measure to get a sense of where we need to be focusing our time, where a search committee needs to be sensitive to how the candidates are approaching different issues, which ones are really important. So your drivers, if you'll look down the top uh, third of the page there, again, this is not a score, it's the degree of focus or the importance. Driver number one, our designated term pastor is present in times of crisis. That is very important. That compared to other churches, that's a very high focus of importance that the pastor is present in times of crisis. A second driver, in preaching, our designated term pastor engages people with a message that enriches their lives and the world. Very important in this congregation. And you're gonna find as you go through, worship is very important in this congregation. So that's, a, again, search committee, you better have a pastor who can preach, or there's gonna be some real strong dissatisfaction in this congregation. Driver three, our designated term pastor com communicates with people in a way that keeps us informed and connected. Again, very important that your pastor be articulate, that your pastor be connected. Driver number four, in important decisions in our church, Adequate opportunity for consideration of different approaches is usually provided. The opportunity to discuss things, the opportunity to research things, the opportunity to disagree. That, I'm not saying that you do that. I'm saying that it's very important to the people who took the survey that this be done well. And finally, the worship services at our church are exceptional in both quality and spirit. We'll see later whether you think that is the case, but what this says is they darn well better be. I would ask you just to briefly take a look at those 
and note what they have in common. Except for driver four, these are pastor dependent comments. These are concerns that say this church at this particular point in time is remarkably pastor centric. And that is not the way it is in every church. Many churches do their best to ignore the pastor and have a good time doing it. But your congregation is signaling that the leadership of the pastor is remarkably crucial here. So if you're on the search committee, don't sleep for the next couple of months, okay? Because the task that you've been given is a life or death issue in this congregation. You better get a good one because that's what this congregation really cares about. Now, know that there's a good side to that if you get a really good pastor. But there's also a bad side to that if you get a really good pastor. And that is that if this continues to be this way in this congregation filled with so many remarkable people, you're gonna crush this pastor and burn out this pastor. These are the kind of things that when you take a look at this report, you have given a lot of data. And when you put it together, it, to someone who's warped enough to spend their life looking at these kind of things, just shouts, whoa, this better be a really strong pastor. It'd be worth finding the really good one that matches well, because this congregation cares about it. It also says to me, having been an area minister and having dealt with church conflict, that this is also what happens when a church has experienced a painful conflict situation. And it would be my guess that you are either engaged in one or coming out of one. And other data in the report points to that and also points to the fact that you are coming out of something and you have done the really hard work well. And I'll point to that as we go through this report, but it's, it's striking what you have included in your responses that says, I, let me give you an example of the way this church operates. Nobody would have asked for in their prayers a pandemic that then made it impossible for you to gather as a church because that's one of the things you love to do. You responded by putting together a worship service that I watched on Sunday that is one of the best produced church services. And I watch a bunch of them. I even wrote my doctoral thesis on the use of cable television by local congregations. And that was back in the eighties. You, you stepped up, you invested in a quality camera and yours really is one of the best that could be watched on a Sunday morning. Now, nobody wanted the pandemic, and that actually was a crisis for all of us. But the question is, do you have the tools to respond to crises because they're going to happen? Can you deal with conflict? Apparently, yes, you can. And apparently, you are currently doing that. Just be aware of it. We'll point to it a couple of times, but that's one of the things that I see in your drivers. If you care that much about the pastor being stunningly competent. It means that you have begun to project onto the pastor some expectations that you could do better than they can, okay? Okay, let's go back to the first of uh, that page four. The second major measure is the energy of a congregation. And there, because it's a survey and church people like to please people and you could answer yes, strongly agree to everything. They sneak some negative questions in there just to see if you're paying attention. And this is just a negatively phrased question. It seems to me that we're just going through the motions of church activity. There isn't much excitement about it among our members. This is not a happy camper statement. Question is, how did the congregation respond? one twentieth of you either strongly or generally 
agreed that, nah, we're just faking it. This place isn't spirit filled. About half of the congregation said, I don't know, we're in a designated pastor era. We're sort of in the middle here. I don't know if I'm going to fully commit. I don't know if anybody else is, but you could convince me. And then half of the congregation said, no, that's not true. We are not just going through the motions. What we're doing is meaningful. People do care, and we're working hard at it. If you compare this response with 2,000 other congregations in the mainline traditions, that's a really good measure. That's a high, it's not a very high, but it's a high level of energy. And these statements really can have consequences as far as the life of the congregation. And I would ask you now to turn to the next page and look at what it is that's driving your energy levels. The whole spirit of our congregation makes people want to get involved as involved as possible. People really care about the spirit of the congregation. Persons who serve as leaders in our church are representative of the membership. That is really important, O oh leaders. Know that people really do care as to whether you're actually listening. We'll see later how people actually rated this. Again, this shows the level of concern, not necessarily performance. Driver number three, in important decisions in our church, adequate opportunity for consideration of different approaches is usually provided. That is high in your congregation. Now drivers two and three say to a regional minister or anybody who looks at these surveys regularly, this is a congregation that is experiencing or is moving through conflict. And it's not helpful to pretend that this is Sunnybrook Farm and everything is going to be fine. Or as Annie would say, tomorrow everything's going to be fine. First thing you need to be doing is being honest with yourselves and saying, yep, there's a, a level of tension here that we can either ignore to our peril or do what we've been doing and that is addressing it in creative and helpful ways. Other statements being part of this church community has given new meaning to my life. That's not unusual. Uh, it's fairly high because it wouldn't be listed here if it weren't, but it's still not outrageously high. And finally, I sense an attitude of genuine care and concern among our members in times of personal need. And again, that's strong in this congregation. It's not outrageously high. You aren't obsessed with it, but you know that you're a part of a congregation that cares and will be there. They have your back and they really will be there in your time of crisis. And that's what churches do. So later on, we're going to check such topics as conflict management, governance, and see how these important topics actually scored in this congregation as far as your opinion of how you're doing. them. But now I would like to present to you what I would say may be the most important page in this entire report. Page six is a chart and on it is a little diamond and that little diamond is your congregation. Now these are four different possibilities when you combine the energy level and the satisfaction level that you reported in the first section. I'm just going to go around quickly and describe who you aren't so you can get a sense of what other churches might be like. <clears throat> you are in the upper right-hand corner. Let's drop down one. If you had low energy, but everybody was very happy. The official name of that is a static congregation. Uh, you are not there. You're not even close to that. It could happen if everybody just stopped working as hard as you are and stopped caring as much as you do. You would still be quite happy. Your pew would be guaranteed to be there waiting for you on a Sunday morning. You could serve on any committee you want because nobody else wants to. I mean, it's satisfying. It's not demanding. 
that's a static congregation. The downside is it's the toughest congregation to change. It's the toughest congregation to try to grow. And it's a congregation that is going to be gone in 10 years, 15 years, because all of those satisfied folks aren't telling anybody else about the church, aren't doing anything to attract anybody else. And they're all, I don't think this will come as news, but going to get older and die and the congregation will disappear. You aren't that. Down in the lower left corner, that's called, today it's now called the reinvention congregations. It used to be called, when I started doing this, the recovery congregations. Um, many people in those congregations and clergy serving them call them hell. They are congregations where Nobody cares enough to do anything, but they're really unhappy about it. And a quarter of the churches taking this uh, survey end up down in the lower left. The great thing about those congregations is they really are unhappy and there is motivation to change. So the pain of unhappiness might be alleviated. And so they actually may, after they fired the pastor, they will then be open to the possibility of change, maybe. The upper left corner is a congregation that I think you're capable of, and fortunately not that. Uh, a number of UCC churches do fall into that category. Um, that's called the chaos quadrant. That is the quadrant where you have very capable people who are very unhappy. And they're really unhappy because everybody else isn't listening to their ideas, which would fix everything if only people would listen. And so pastors come in and spontaneously combust, and then they get another one, and then they get another one. Uh, it's a congregation sometimes uh, of people who really enjoy attacking other people. And so the congregation may stay around for a long time. You are not that congregation. You may thank God for that. Uh, you are over in what's called, and actually you're where everybody in all those other three quadrants wishes they could be. Please don't get smug, but you are called the transformation quadrant. Please write that down. And please note that you are solidly in the transformation quadrant. Were you a little bit lower down or a little bit more to the left, um, I would be giving you a whole speech about being in a transition phase and the fact that you could very easily slip down and you aren't solidly, but you're, you're solidly in the transformation stage. If you look down below, it says the high energy, high satisfaction quadrant is the transformation quadrant. Churches in this quadrant are sources of new meaning and purpose for their members. They also may serve as mentors to other churches. I would say looking at this and looking at what we've seen in the first couple of responses and your drivers, I would say don't pay as much attention to helping other churches be like you. I think your energies for the near future do need to continue to be focused on the internal work that you need to be doing to be bringing a sense of harmony and a sense of unity and a sense of purpose to this congregation. You have the potential to do it. You have the skills to do it. I would not at this point decide that the first thing we've got to do is go fix everybody else. Or in a mission sense, the first thing we've got to do is go and get vaccines to everybody in the world. Yes, those things must be done, but it's not Congregational Church of Salisbury's wisest first step in June of 2021. Know that indeed you are being compared with 2000 churches and there are a lot of very unhappy, very unhealthy churches, but you're not one of those. And for that, let us all be grateful and see, okay, what do we do now? If we turn to the next page, page seven, 
critical success factors for improving satisfaction. This page is in every report that gets sent out. It's clearly designed for the churches in the other three quadrants, especially in the two lower quadrants. It really isn't aimed at you and your response to this, it basically says, what do you really care about that you're not really satisfied with from the responses that you give in the rest of the report? And if you look at the strength of your responses and then look at the interpretation down at the bottom of the page, for something to be urgent, you have to be greater than 50 on this graph. None are urgent according to the way you responded to this. So if you ask the question, what should we do now? My first response is don't panic, okay? It really would be kind of silly because you really are in good shape in so many ways. And you have many very satisfied people. And it says, if you rated it from 35 to 50, it would be important and you should address it soon. By the end of this year, you should have a committee taking a look at this. None of your concerns rise to that level. You're the kind of church that drive consultants crazy because you're actually pretty well off. Doesn't mean you can be smug about it, but it does mean that there is nothing here that you really need to figure out by tomorrow at this time. You did rate as your highest critical success factor for improving, if you wanna improve that satisfaction score, if you were to do something about lifelong learning motivation, getting people, uh, congregations may be very good at setting up programs and then nobody shows up. How do you get the members of this congregation to say, I would really benefit from an educational program of some, some sort. Uh, that's one area where people would say, thank you for that, I greatly appreciate it. Then uh, there are three that I would say, again, say, we've got conflict work that we're working on, resolving problems, clergy present for needs, and tolerance of differences. That you could do better or you are dealing with some really big challenges and you're moving through it. But it's a concern that you do want to keep aware of. And finally, the new meaning to life. Uh, your congregation with the energy and the satisfaction you have really could be providing folks with the answer to the question, well, what do I do now? And that could be that you have a large group of retirees who have been really good at whatever they used to get paid for. And now the question is, and what can I do now that's going to make a difference? That's what that is getting at. But again, it's at 22 points, and that's not a crucial dissatisfaction. Let's move on to the next page, which does need some explaining. Again, this is an answer to the question, what might we do now? And let me point out that first line there, when members were asked where they wanted additional energy placed, this is how they rank the 17 options. So be aware of the fact that this is not a ranking of where you want energy placed overall. For example, I would guess that you place a ton of energy in the work of worship and preparation for worship and participation in worship. But you rated as 15th the priority deepen our sense of connection to God and one another through stronger worship services because that wouldn't be honest. You do think you have strong worship services and you know that they make a difference, but it's not a priority for additional energy to be. Okay, does that make sense? So that's what we're looking at here on this page are priorities that you might address more than you currently are. And the first one is make necessary changes to attract families with children and youth in our church. I would like to welcome you to being a church in the 21st century because every 
church that fills this out, except one or two freak churches that don't like people have this rated as number one. So this is just to measure, are you normal? But do notice that maybe you didn't read it carefully. It says, make necessary changes. And remember, you're a church. Uh, those two things don't always go together. And one of the things I want you to keep aware of is that it's very important to know how flexible you are. And we're going to take a look at that in a minute. But that's what you have rated as the highest priority that you need to be addressing is somehow making our church more attractive to families with children and youth. The second highest priority, which they say is average, which is the understatement of the rest of the report, develop and implement a comprehensive strategy to reach new people and incorporate them into the life of the church. Occasionally, this is rated as number one just to make things interesting, but it's always one or two. We are an institution which is called by God to be evangelists to spread the wonderful gift that we've been given. Or we are a group of people who are really worried about whether the budget is going to collapse next year, and we know that we need a larger group of participants. Whatever your motivation, as a church, you would like to attract new people. The third one, create more opportunities for people to form meaningful relationships. For example, small groups, nurtured friendships, shared meals, etc. This one wakes me right up. Notice on the left-hand side that in light print, there's a comparison with the rest of the benchmarking group here. The first two were boringly average. The third one is stunningly high. I don't remember ever seeing a church that in New England that actually wanted to get to know other people. Uh, it means probably two things. One, you're a little bit out in the country and you really do like the sight of human beings occasionally. That's unusual and you're open to it. And what better organization today to bring people together and somehow extract them from the ethernet. But that's one I would ask you as you take a look back at this later on after you're out of the days that you're obviously falling into because we've been doing this now for a long time. Take a look at how you compare to other churches. And I would point out down at the ninth priority, another high would be work as an advocate for social and institutional change so that society might better reflect the values of the kingdom of God. That in some ways uh, echoes the fourth priority, which is high, work to renew and revitalize the community around the church by building coalitions with partners. And the fifth one, expand outreach ministries that provide direct services to those living on the margins of society. Those are interestingly outward focused and a strength of this congregation, I would guess, because it's consistent with the rest of your responses know that. And please don't hear my earlier comment about not going out and saving the world, doing the internal work you need to do. You do need to do internal work, but part of your reason for being is as a mission outpost in the middle of Northwestern Connecticut. And it's great to see that compared to most churches, your uh, responses are much more enthusiastic than usual. You can take a look at the rest of this with the understanding that these are additional energies that are going to be put there. But if I were to be summing up what's going on here, I'd say you are a church with high energy and high satisfaction that hopes to sustain or grow its membership and to have a positive impact on the community around it. You are also a congregation that will be in tension with that because you do need to continue to do work in conflict resolution. And the main, if I were your doctor at the end of the medical checkup, I would say the only concern I've got is that you'll become complacent and stop taking your medications. Uh, you really are in great shape and you're happy about it. In your search for a new pastor, know that that's the best thing you can offer. It's even better than bean suppers. If a church is energized, and if a church 
does not have roast pasta for Sunday lunch. You, re you don't have bad habits developed over years of loathing the clergy. This is a wonderful gift and not always the case. So search committee know that part of your job is sales and you have just established, you have data to point to that this is a, a remarkably attractive place for even for you to be church leaders. The next couple of pages, page nine, does a comparison with people from other age from other age groups, and it basically says you don't have enough in the under thirty-five group to even measure. So we'll be thankful to God that they are there, but uh, know that when you do compare the other two age groups, and when you compare people who are infrequent and frequent, basically people agree with each other. Uh, I think there's one uh, priority in each of those groups that's not like the others, but the other. Uh, five out of six are all similar to the other group. Page 11 is just a description of the amazing bubble chart that will appear when you turn to page 12. Uh, this is the page for all those who miss Lawrence Welk. Does anybody miss Lawrence Welk? Uh, this is the bubble page. And the bubble page is a dramatic presentation of the fact that basically you agree with each other remarkably. There there may be conflict and difference of opinions, but as far as general sense of what the priorities ought to be in the future, you agree with each other across the board. And your focus is on ta -da, growing the church and bringing in new families, okay? That's the end of part one. That's the end of the initial, how are you feeling about this place? Where are we in the hopefulness department? We are very hopeful at this point. If you ran into somebody in the line and post office and wanted to have elevator music to offer them, what would you say about your congregation that is actually true, other than we'd really like you to bring your kids? Well, in this part two, which is fairly short, you get, a, I think, a very helpful measure. I think I know your congregation now. And as a UCC former bureaucrat, um, you belong in the UCC. Uh, but let me take this page, page 13, to explain the format of the rest of the report. It first presents a set of questions that you have already seen because they were on the survey and you responded from strongly disagree to strongly agree. So those are the questions that then response percentages, how did these particular questions, they call them, mostly their statements, how were those responded to? Did people in your congregation agree or disagree? In this case, you have a breakdown of how people in your church, so when the person says, I feel strongly about this, and I'm not the only one who does, we can actually take a look and see how do people feel about taking the Bible literally in the Salisbury Congregational Church. In fact, we will then take that and say, compared to other churches, how much of a mix is this congregation? And you see that line there, compared with other churches, our theological diversity is high. This is not unusual in a church in the country. And it may be one of the only places in the world where you can get to know and regularly meet with and perhaps discuss topics with people who don't agree with you. Wow, I mean, this is unheard of today, but you've got this church that does this and compared to other churches, your theological diversity is pretty high. You can expect to be disagreed with. And then at the bottom of each page, your responses, basically a composite of those responses, and each of the questions responses will then be compared with the other 2000 churches. For example, in this case, let's look at theological question number three. The statement is, scripture is the literal word of God without error, not only in matters of faith, but also in historical, geographical, and other secular matters. 
in this congregation, let's take a look at how you responded to Theo question number three. 53%, over half strongly disagree. 11% disagree. So put those two together and you've got two thirds of the congregation has some energy in disagreeing with the statement, we take scripture literally. But notice that over on the right, 3.2% agree, 6.5% strongly agree. 10%, one in 10 people in this congregation do take the scriptures literally. And probably in most of those cases, keep it quiet because a gang of people strongly feel otherwise. But what a resource you have there that perhaps you're not tapping into. One in 10 people take scriptures literally in this congregation. Hmm. So that's what you're going to see in this congregation. If you look down below, the, the group in general uh, and in most of the questions is well to the left theologically, not politically necessarily, not socially or morally or whatever, but theologically, you are very, very progressive. But it does mean that if you're going to talk to a new member, you might want to say to them, and it you can expect to hear a fairly progressive approach to theology. That way they don't step over the, the threshold and then halfway through John's sermon run away screaming. It's just not fair. Take a look at the next page. And this is the second of the descriptive indices. It's the only other one on page 14. Again, you've got the questions at the top, the way you responded in the middle, and then the way you compared. Take a look at question two. Our church tends to stay very close to established ways of doing things. First of all, you're a church. That means you get together so you can do things the way you've always done them. In your congregation, 10% of the people disagree fairly strongly that we tend to stay fairly close to the way we always do things. And about two thirds of this congregation agree, yeah, that's us. We do stay pretty close to the way we've always done things. But notice how that's spread out across the different strengths of feeling. And then you look down below and see churches are very conservative organizations. They conserve the scriptures for the next generation. They conserve the rituals and traditions. They conserve the buildings. And when you compare your enjoyment of things as they are with other churches, if you look at that index in the bottom, you are more flexible than seven of 10 churches. You're still a church. And change does not happen with great ease. Or uh, there are one or two churches that are compelled to change every four or five weeks. Uh, if you ever did the Christmas Eve service the way you did it last year, you are slacker. <laughs> okay, that is, there are churches like that, but very small number. You are remarkably flexible and you can make the kind of changes that you may need to make to attract new members, even members with families. That's what this says. Compared to most churches, you are pretty flexible. And if we take a look at the next page and we put those two characteristics on a graph, you can find your little diamond over in the left-hand upper quadrant. And again, let me describe what happens if you are the other kinds of churches the church to your right, the upper right hand, which is adaptable but conservative, those are the churches that 
people wonder why you're not like them because they just built their building and they're now attracting 500 people on a Sunday morning. And then when Christmas Eve comes, they have like the Rockettes from Radio City Music Hall and 4,000 people in their passion play on Easter and a real Jesus dies there and they videotape it and they send it out on network television. Okay, that's a performance church, we call them. And those do boom and they do then end up quite often with empty buildings. They are usually pastor centric and they are much more conservative than you ever will be. You are not a performance church, okay? If you're down in the conservative settled group, you know all the answers and you know who they are and you don't want to be like them and you don't want your kids to be anywhere near them, okay? You aren't like that at all. Uh, those are called hearth and home churches. They are wonderfully comfortable for those who want to be certain and have people around them who are absolutely certain. Over in the lower left, we have a number of UCC churches that are progressive, but like to do things the way they've done them for 150 years. That we call the Holy Spirit churches or the paraclete churches. I call them the hospital churches because uh, they're the Statue of Liberty churches. Give us your tired, your poor. If you're broken down, come here. We have a program for you. You can count on our having a sense of openness to you, even if you haven't done all things right. The downside of a church like this, which sounds like what Jesus said we should be, is that they burn out. They do attract very troubled people and they are not equipped to be a social service agency. You're not that. You're up in the upper left corner and you're among the majority of UCC churches. Uh, you are what they call a magi church. You are like the magi slightly insane in that you enjoy getting on camels, riding off into the desert and following a star because you have a hunch that it's going to lead something. You may try all sorts of really interesting things and be brilliant and fail a lot too. But that's the way you are. That's very exciting. It's very attractive. And again, if you want to bring in new members, tell them about the things that you do and the dreams that you have, because this is a dreamer church. If they, uh, they say, if you want a character to offer to people, say we're a bunch of lovable Don Quixotes. We really do think that there's a force out there that we're going to go, <laughs> and it may look like a windmill to you. These are the churches that are the most inclusive of churches. And I would guess that you are too. The downside of being a Magi church is that you're too nimble. And for example, if you've had a conflict, you're tired of having a conflict, you're ready to move on to the, something much more exciting and good for the world. But you really do need to do some more work. If today's concern is the uh, families on the border of Mexico and the United States and you come up with a great plan for it and you have a study group that does book studies on it, that's important and good. The problem with a church like this is six months from now there's going to be a headline that's going to just knock you into tears and you're going to form another group that does a study on that and you may not pay enough attention to the previous concern because the world is full of them. That's what happens to Magi churches. They really do have exciting journeys. They don't always end up anywhere. So that is your style. And that's the end of part two. If you turn to the next page, you'll probably gag. I don't think this is a helpful page. You immediately focus on your spiritual vitality being at 5%. Oh my God, we're going to hell. What did we do wrong? I didn't mean to be progressive, blah, 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 blah. Uh, let's just say, if you need to refer back to this page, you can, but let's look at each of these items in detail. And that's what you get on page 17 and the rest of the report. It breaks down the way you responded to those statements or questions. It does it, it reports it in the same format. It takes 
the questions and you can refer to what you were responding to. It then says how you as a congregation agreed with things. And then it says, how do you compare with other churches? And let me at this point say, for you, some of these may be much more helpful if you basically stop in the middle. You have taken the time to find out how everybody feels. You did get more responses than you usually get on a Sunday morning. More, you, you got 68 responses, you usually get 50 people on a Sunday morning these days. Statistically, those are really strong responses. You have a good representative response. So what you are looking at in the middle of the page may be the most important data. For example, on this one, if you take a look at question number four, I sense an atmosphere of genuine care and concern among our members in time of personal need. I mean, that is a key heartbeat of the church question. Look at the way you responded in the middle there, host number four, hospitality number four. 98 0.4% of the members of this church agree with that statement. And most of them agree strongly with that statement. Your congregation really does feel supported. And yet when you look at the way it compares to other congregations, you're only in the 65th percentile. You're a third of the churches are more compassionate or think they're more compassionate than you are. And I'm not sure how helpful that is. I think that may be a reflection of the fact that you happen to be in New England. And people in New England don't wear their pain and suffering on their sleeves. And they certainly don't if they go to a congregational church. So you may have responded to this, yes, I tend to agree. Because I tend to respond to everything that way because I'm from New England. Okay. So you are a pretty darn hospitable church for a New England church. Could you be more hospitable? Having been to many churches as a stranger, there's no question you can be. You come to church because you love the support you've got there. You may be tired. You may be worn out. You may not be in a recruiting mood. You may want to see somebody you haven't seen in a long time. But know that it makes a difference. And hospitality is the key to reaching those new members who happen to wander in. So we're going to see a number of scores. Your hospitality score does not knock anybody's socks off on the previous page, but that was a measure of the way you compare with all churches. I would say the more important data in hospitality is how do you feel about whether the church has your back, whether the church really cares about you. And apparently you feel pretty good about that. The next performance index is an important one in every church. In this, if you were to take a look down at the bottom as how you compare with other churches, you're about two thirds of the way up on the morale index. Uh, again, that may be a reflection of the fact that you have been struggling with some issues and that has sapped energy and enthusiasm and has caused some conflict. Morale suffers from that. But know that two thirds of the churches in America are, in, are not feeling that kind of enthusiasm and energy the way you are. So know that even in a time of struggle, your morale is sustaining at a sustaining level. And let's take a look at the next page because I think that explains some of that. Again, I may be completely missing the point and you can let me know about this. I do think that you have gone through conflict and that you are managing it. And I think this tool actually measured that. There were question one and question four are phrased negatively trying to get you to say yes to conflict. There is a disturbing amount of conflict in our congregation. There is frequently a small group of members that opposes what the majority want to do. Okay, uh, that second one is true of every church. Uh, the question is how do you respond to that reality in the church? But those two are descriptors that say, do we think 
there is conflict at this point in time. And in this church to one and four, there was a fairly significant response to that. And in these indices, they take a negative question and they report it just the way you voted. So it, it says, we strongly agree that there is conflict here. Okay, but take a look at the second and the third. Problems between groups in this church are usually resolved through mutual effort. Among most of our members, there is a healthy tolerance of differences of opinion. Those are questions saying, have you developed the skills necessary to deal with difficult situations? You may have been given a terribly difficult situation or two or five, but the question is, do you have the skills? And look at how you responded to those two. Don't look down below. Look at the way you actually agreed. 87% of you agreed that, yeah, problems usually everybody works at resolving. And the th third one, among most of our members is a healthy tolerance, which is not present in every church. 89% agreed, yeah, that's the way we try to operate. That is a very strong affirmation of the fact that you have the skills, you have had the experiences. And if you're wondering, okay, how do we get this behind us and move into more positive, more attractive life as a church? The answer to this question is not get a consultant who will teach you how to do this. It is not arrest the troublemakers and throw them out of the church. The answer to this is look at what you've been doing for the past couple of years, because clearly it works with this group of people. And I want to say congratulations. And I want to say that's actually a strong reading from this tool that you in no way meant to point out. But it's there. That's the skills measurement part of this index. And you have pointed out, yeah, if we find ourselves in times of trouble, not only Mother Mary, but everybody in this congregation can engage and like adults deal with things that we'd rather not, and feel like we're a part of a church, not the winners of a political battle. So if there's a real value to this whole exercise, I would say this page and the next one, because the question is, do you also have a measure of how people feel about the way decisions get made in this church, and not just in conflict, but most of the time you're not conflicted. Most of the time you're being a church and you're really enjoying being together and you're worshiping in a powerful way. So let's look at how you feel about the governance here because you can put that together with your conflict management scores and you get the heart of what I would call the real value of this exercise for this congregation. For example, in this one, the first question. The leaders of our church show a genuine concern to know what people are thinking when decisions need to be made. Now that's not conflict specific, but it could engage in conflict. You are the leaders of this church. What do they think of you? 90% of this congregation say thank you. Say, yep, we do know how to make decisions together in a healthy way. I'll tell you, if this were the case in every church, you wouldn't have regional ministers. But you do, and they're very busy people. Because this is not the way most churches see their governance. Certainly not most churches that actually do a CAT scan. Uh, this vital signs report is pointing out that you indeed do have a governance structure that works. You may have had some difficult issues and we are all wishing that wouldn't happen to good people like you but it's what churches do you have the tools and you have a really positive outlook in the future as a church as an organization 
in part because there is a trust level that makes it possible to be a leader in this congregation. So thank you for being leaders and for taking on these responsibilities, but know that you're not wasting your time and effort and you're not setting yourself up for failure. This is a congregation that knows what governance is all about and it appreciates it. It's a driver in this congregation that we be led by good people that we trust. And it, the measure of it is, thank God, that's the case here because we really care about it. The next page is a complete waste of our time. So I won't spend much time on it. It's your punishment for being in New England. Uh, look at the questions. My spiritual experience, my spirituality, I experience the presence of God. I work to connect my faith. Although my faith is important. The name of your church is the congregational church. It's not the holy guy or the holy woman church. Uh, it's congregation. New Englanders are herd animals. Uh, we really think it's wrong to tell somebody how holy you are. It's really wrong to share a spiritual experience unless you really trust the person and they know what you're talking about. So compared to many, 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 many churches, New Englanders are as spiritually vital as uh, they are emotionally expressive, which is not. So uh, ignore this page. I tell the people that holy cow that they, it should have been gone years ago. And do they listen? Another page, page 22, uh, you are not what they would call an evangelical church. You are a New England church, but you are engaged in very good work. You are engaged in worship. Uh, if you look at one of the things that you think is pretty important, it's having lay leadership. Yes, right now you are obsessed with how well your pastor performs in all different ways, but at heart, you basically are a church that thinks the leadership of this church should be prepared and well prepared to lead a religious organization. And again, if you look at the way you rated yourself, uh, you do a pretty good job. You don't consider this a major, major driver, though, so we won't spend a great deal of time on it. Let's take a look at the next page, page 23. This, I think, is the most fascinating response. And I even called the person at Holy Cow and said, explain this thing to me. And she said, I have no idea. When you talk to these people, you come back and you tell me why they rated their interest in education compared to other churches as non-existent or meh. <laughs> you know, this, I mean, my understanding is that in Northwest, uh, the industry in Northwest Connecticut is prep schools, isn't it? I, this is not an area of people who are allergic to education. This is also not apparently from your other responses, an area where everybody knows all the answers to everything by age of 60. So why is it that you are really not all that interested in putting energy into education? One of the areas that I would ask you to explore is why does this particular congregation, which at the end of the report, you rate the education level of this church as something that has single-handedly kept higher education afloat in America. Why is it that there isn't a passion for opportunities for educational growth? That's just a question. It's very unusual for a Magi church, which loves to read a book and solve a problem, to not want to get together and do that. And the question that comes to my mind is, you know, if I were to come up with a reason, I would guess, well, majority are uh, retirees and maybe they'd rather just get together rather than get, have to prepare and come and work and be a study group. But the question for we mature folk is, uh, what's the legacy you wanna be leaving for this church? And if you really do wanna have younger families in there, uh, you need to be an exciting educational institution. 
And finally, the question I would ask if you do rate yourself this low is what impact do you want to have? And can you have that kind of an impact as a church if you aren't spending time in religious education, social issues education, effectiveness in community organizing education? Uh, it, it, it boggles my mind. So please know that you have provided me a very good reason to be intrigued with your congregation. And finally, let's look at the last of the performance indices because you think this is it. You really may take your energy out of some of the other things that I just whined about, but you really care about your worship and your music. And when you rate yourselves, those who agree that your music program is outstanding in quality and appropriate, 96.7% agree with that. And when you look at the general statement, the worship services in our church are exceptional, not good, but exceptional in both quality and spiritual content. 91 point, I mean, that is such a demanding question. Nine out of 10 people answered, yes, that is the case here. I really think that's important to focus on. If you look down below, you then see, you put those together and that puts you in the 79th percentile on that page that had all those dashboard of speedometers. I don't think that's an accurate measurement. I think this is a congregation that has very high standards for worship and music. And it's a congregation that is very affirmative when it comes to the question, how are we doing? That is sort of the end of the report that needs to be interpreted. You've got additional pages, which are basically statistics. You've got, and those are understandable. You've got uh, some of the modules that you uh, did include, and you can take a look at those and they will inform you. This is how I would sum up what this report says about you. It says that you fall into the category of being a transformational church, which is survey talk for you are a healthy congregation. Compared to 2,000 other congregations, you are a healthy, strong congregation. And although worrying is one of the things we are good at, don't waste your energy on that because you are in the position that most churches wish they were. If you were to describe to someone your congregation who has never heard of it, you would say you have a unique architecture of your steeple. I saw a picture of that. I've never seen a church with a steeple like that. I've got to come out and come to that church one of these days so I can say I've been there. But you also are a Magi church. You are, I think, one of the most interesting types of churches. And if you want to attract new people, you're in a very good position because you're interesting and attractive. You also are flexible, which means you will be one of those that survives when things change. If you were to look at the things that you are most concerned about, it would be, I think, at this point in your history, equally divided between how good is our worship and how well do we govern. And in both of those, you give yourselves pretty high marks. And I thank you for that, because that's what you need to be doing at this point in time if you're going to survive as a church. You also indicate, and I think it's a very important indication, that you are pastor-centric. And as a search committee, you should know that you need somebody who is maybe a little bit overconfident. You need somebody who can take a very heavy load and carry it for a long time. You need somebody who actually enjoys that kind of work and will thrive on it. And from just looking at your other things, uh, you expect one of the brightest people in the world, one of the best worship leaders, and also a warm and available person. And I would not accept any less if I were you because you are a very attractive church. 
If you were to ask what your major priorities are, they are survival, like everybody else, to sustain our community, but also to reach out to the area around us. And that's a very healthy sign. So if I were to sum all of what I see here, it would be, see you next year is what the doctor always says. And so there's something wrong. You really are in the, like they say to my 101 year old father, I'm really impressed. See you next year. We now have, I've taken an additional nine minutes of your evening, but we, uh, you have, by the way, behaved wonderfully. You have taken in, I hope, a ton of information. So I will be quiet. Well, Tom, I seem to be the, the quickest one to unmute myself. My name is Betsy Beck, and I am the moderator of this church. Uh, and tonight, in addition to being somewhat overwhelmed with the amount of information and trying to figure it all out, I just want to thank you for uh, walking us through all of this. It was, uh, you know, a I tend to hear the things that are negative and go, oh, no, oh, no, oh, no. But I'm grateful for your uh, ability to help us see ourselves in a, in a positive light. Uh, so I'll leave it there and let other people who are unmuted say a few things. But I want to thank you. I, I'm Lorna Edmonds and Tom. I'm chair of the Board of Deacons. And uh, I'm very encouraged by this report. Um, I, we have been through a rough period, but I, I do believe we're working extremely well together and pulling through it. And, um, you know, I certainly give Pastor John a huge amount of credit for helping us do that, but it's been a team effort. It's been a, um, it's been a very, very rewarding to work with a lot of very competent and dedicated and generous people. It's, uh, it's uh, I'm very encouraged by the report. Tom, thank you very much um, for everything and particularly explaining this report in a way to make it understandable and fascinating. Um, I'd like to return to the most fascinating question and ask, what about this question of education means that it is focused so much on the education of adults through small groups, which I love the idea of asking that question among ourselves, but it seems in your interpretation of it that it didn't include Sunday school and the education of, of children. So I just want to understand that better. Is it truly meant to just be uh, an, the education of adults? Good question. Take a look at the questions that you actually responded to at the top of the page there. Uh, our members understand they have a spiritual responsibility for lifelong learning and formation. Mm -hmm. So uh, I may have made a comment that sounded like it was focused at elders, but uh, the question that was actually asked and measured of this congregation would have ranged from uh, what we usually consider as church school through adult education. Uh, the second one, our church provides opportunities for education and formation in a variety of ways so that I can find one that fits my complex lifestyle. Uh, that may sound like it's focused on seniors or uh, older members, in part because you did not have a large component of younger and church school age people filling us out, but having grandchildren who have more complex lifestyles and occasionally are not busy, um, I think that still could apply to them were they uh, included. And finally, I'd say our church provides high quality education that's appropriate to every age and stage of life. Uh, I think the tool actually measured the broad range, my comments may have been focused and my challenges may have been focused in an area, uh, but I, again, did not uh, speak for the whole report by saying it's not important or you're not doing it. Uh, but your level of 
uh, agreement in these, um, considering the questions are asked over the whole range, age range, uh, are still surprisingly not strong. So I, I would say there's concern here about, or, or lack of concern about children's education as much as there is about adults. Thank you for that. Lots to talk about, I think. <laughs> it is fascinating. Yeah. Maybe we're just cocky and we think we're so well-educated that we're all set, but. <laughs> and you may actually be. But, you know, uh, there's, a, there's another thing I was thinking of. Uh, this is, uh, particularly this period of time, uh, uh, there's, there's the Zoom meetings and what's being offered in our area is enormous. I mean, you could tune into something that the libraries are offering or the adult education centers are offering or the, um, or the uh, you know, the theater, the local theaters are of. It's a place where it's very rich in educational opportunities. There's the Salisbury Forum with, so I, I'm not, I don't know if everyone feels the same uh, great need mm -hmm. Uh, for as much education from the church, since this is an area where it's everywhere. And, and you brought up a, a good point that you took this at the tail end of one of the weirdest 15 months we've experienced in our lifetime. This right. pandemic impact on the life of a church, pandemic impact on the way people feel about their church. I would strongly encourage you, and this is not a pitch, I don't get a percentage, Consider the possibility of this report establishing a pandemic baseline for you. You're going to go through the process of selecting a new pastor. Three to five years from now, run it again in a time when I certainly hope we haven't just gone through another pandemic and get a sense of, okay, how does that compare with where, where have we been growing? What Was this educational concern one that we responded to in a different way in a different time? Hi, I'm Cynthia. I'm a deacon. Um, I think too, it's it's what what do we think education is? I was really excited to hear you say, you know, it could be um, you know social justice training. It could be all the stuff that maybe we hadn't thought about 10, 15, 20 years ago. Um, so just thinking about these ideas of what education is um, is exciting to me and and could be helpful. And I think sometimes at church you know, meetings, something maybe like an optional educational thing that's not about uh, the Bible, et cetera, can be seen. You know, I think when we've been asked to meet and talk about what we want at church, sometimes it's like, let's not talk about, it. let's just get on with it. Let's just do it. I think we've been, you know, there's probably been an attitude of like real doers and let's get on with it and stop hemming and hawing. And, and maybe education got lumped in there somehow, sometimes. Just a thought. Uh, Tom, thank you. Uh, this has been tremendously, tremendously helpful and and informative. And and I I think most of us tend to agree with. And I didn't see many surprises here, except for one. Um, I don't see us as a transformative uh, transformative church. And I, I'm just wondering how that uh, how that came up. Or uh, uh, I, I think we are adaptable. I think we are progressive. Mm -hmm. But transformation, I, I don't see that. I wouldn't put that as 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 something that really really drives us as a church. So I was just wondering how how that. Uh, uh, it was. Is there certain questions that come up with that, or is it just uh, our profile versus other 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 churches? Um, and for me, it sort of comes up to. I think, yeah, and I think we we, we want we want a transformative uh, um, uh, a pastor or other people, and I think that sort of sits in. And, and this, this is just my personal take on this: that uh, we're we're not lazy, but we want things fed to us, and uh, to put the heavy lifting and work into being a truly transformative uh, uh, a church. I don't quite see that and put the really effort into us being a lifelong of learning. would rather just come and have a charismatic preacher uh, on, on Sundays and then we can go home. Uh, no, I'm, I'm being a little bit rhetorical here or trying to uh, uh, prove, prove a point here, but that, that's, the, that's the one part of this that I didn't, um, I didn't quite, uh, didn't resonate with me. <laughs> and that may be the term transformational that may be the problem. Uh, what they are signifying there is the high level of satisfaction and the high energy level. What they're talking about there is a potential. The way you do it is your style and that's 
that's the Magi, but the term transformational is talking about, as I understand it, you have the potential to deal with changing times. You have the potential to make a difference in that community around you. Uh, I can see how the idea of bringing in a pastor who preaches transformation, um, I actually served a church once that called the next pastor who did that and that church no longer exists because the people did not feel loved. They felt rejected and judged. And that could be transformational, uh, a meaning for transformational, but that's not what they're getting at here. What they're, they're just using a term that says, you really do have a potential for change in a good direction. I, th I think that's what they're getting at. And all of these terms are limited. I, I think the worst one is the style one that is paraclete. That doesn't help anybody. Even if you do biblical study on it, nobody knows what that word means. So transformational, I think is better than paraclete, but may not be helpful in some situations. Hi, hi Tom. I'm a, my name is Charlie Noyes. I'm just, I'm just a citizen. Uh, but I have a question. I don't, I don't want to keep on harping on the education um, page, but that's just because I'm a teacher. But um, it, it's the only page that I had a hard time following your interpretation, just because I looked at the numbers. Mm -hmm. um, and so maybe you could help explain a little bit. Um, for the first question, this is page 23, uh, where our members understand that they have a spiritual responsibility for lifelong learning and, for, and formation. Mm -hmm. um, essentially, from 10 to we do a strong degree, that's 84%, mm -hmm. which seems, I don't know, pretty good. But then when we compare ourselves to other churches, we're down around 12%. So I guess with other churches, there's it's quite a bit higher than 84%. Uh, I think um, what, you, what you need to look at is the strength of those responses. Okay. And, uh, strongly agree to question one is 6.1. Yeah. Uh, many, many churches consider the showing up on Sunday and showing up on Wednesday night as key to salvation. Not many mainline churches that way, but a, a real importance, I strongly agree. There's no question about it. We need that education or we're lost. How are we gonna know this stuff? Nobody else teaches it. So I, I think what you're picking up there, and I think actually one of the values of this comparison at the bottom of the page is that your percentile rank is based in part on the strength of the responses. Yeah. And that is not the, a, anywhere near as strong as, for example, look at the strength in worship and music and things like that. The total is not all that different, but the number of people, it's half the church strongly agrees as far as worship, but one twentieth agree as far as that particular education question. Janet Accardo, I'm actually the chair of the trustees, and I want to thank you, as others have, for helping us with interpreting all of this data. I think we really did need um, for you to do that for us. Uh, and I do agree with Lorna um, Edmondson about the education, especially during this time of COVID. We have so many offerings to us uh, up here in the Northwest corner through the Taconic Learning uh, Center, as she said, adult education courses that we've probably had our fill of education. And then we're coming to church on Sunday more to come together as a community of caring people um, rather than a need for uh, Christian education classes. So that doesn't mean things that might not change going forward. Um, I wanted to ask you a question though. When you were taking us through the drivers of energy at the beginning on page five, uh, we had um, the drivers one and two were high and, and three, and you said it might indicate uh, a level of conflict. Uh, and I didn't understand how you derive that from these drivers. Uh, it had to do with the spirit in the congregation makes people want to get as involved as possible. Persons who serve as leaders in our church are representative of the membership uh, and important decisions in our church. Adequate opportunity for consideration of different approaches is usually provided. And you were saying this indicates a level of conflict. I, I believe I said that driver two and driver three uh, 
point okay. in that. And the reason for that is uh, in your congregation, there really was concern. There was focus on uh, the fact that you can trust your uh, leaders as true representatives of the membership. It's not some little cabal that's telling us what we have to do. Uh, that question is set up to measure the, the tension in the congregation, the trust level in the congregation. And uh, again, these drivers say not how you feel about the trust level. They say that it's really important. And a church that is in a conflict situation is usually much more aware of their need for representative government, for trusting, trustable leaders. So I, that's why I pointed to that one. And the driver number three, in important decisions in our church, adequate opportunity for consideration of different approaches is usually provided, that we do have a process that doesn't railroad something through, that we aren't forced to go along with something. Now, we've got a problem here that really needs to be looked at from a number of different perspectives. And we have a number of people's ideas on this. And in this church, unlike some, and perhaps even unlike this church at some points in its history, we actually do listen. And, and if that's a real concern, that's a good thing, especially if you're in a conflict situation, but it does sort of point to the fact that that's what people are thinking about. That's what people are concerned about. And to me, then, that says uh, something's going on or yeah. something has been going on and they're still oh, I see. Uh -huh. mm. Yeah, I, I, I meant to piggyback on Charlie's question. Um, you know, and this, the emphasis here, I, I like everybody else, I was a little surprised, but also not surprised by the education results, just simply because we have so many people who are in education one way or the other. And, and I just feel like a lot of times, plus with all the other opportunities, but I would also like to say that I think that the idea of having this really pastor-centric um, expectation, I think the word is, is that we expect to be educationally fulfilled on Sunday morning in the form of the sermon, I think, perhaps. Mm -hmm. um, and that might also be affecting the way that at least I would think of it, um, particularly in light of the data points that you've already pointed out with how we what we expect from from such a strong um, pastoral candidate. We better get a we better get an intellectually and intellectual and ed educationally enriched sermon on Sunday morning. And I think that may be kind of the way we think of this as well. Mm -hmm. if, if I could jump in and, and just uh, tack on to that, I, I'm looking at and listening to you talking about the pastor-centric issue. And I think my concern because of history, recent history especially, is uh, the possibility of burning out pastors. Uh, and that is, that that's not that's not good for us because quite honestly i'm looking at the screens i don't think any of us really want to go through a whole lot of transition here but uh we feel like we've been through a lot and um and so i i think it, i don't know if you have any suggestions for things we can start to address that will help us make sure we don't, we, we step away from that pastor centric or we somehow try to moderate it somehow. I would say the survey points to how about education as that, as an area. John is a very good teacher and pastor. He was ordained as a pastor and teacher, but your congregation, unlike most is remarkably filled with educators and educators who may very well not agree with John on certain things and what a wealth of possibilities you've got there. And that's one opportunity for John to go and sit and be part of the group and throw in his brilliant ideas without having to have spent hours the week before getting ready for it. But it, it I'm trying to remember the name of the guy on the Red Sox commercials, the fishing guy. And he, he says, so many flavors. 
in a strong <laughs> Boston accent. Oh, wow, there's Char so many flavors. Charlie Moore. Charlie Moore, that's right. Okay. I think it's an obnoxious ad, but that <laughs> so many flavors is the, the best part of it. And that could describe your educational offerings. You've got a range of biblical interpretation possibilities in that congregation, and they don't all agree with the pastor and won't. And that might be a good place to start. And one of the positive effects is that the, might actually get the pastor straightened out on a certain topic that he's not quite, <laughs> which is very well, I think one of the things, and this has been brought up before, we did this at the end of COVID. And so having in-person meetings and classes and stuff was not happening. And I think a lot of us were doing a lot of Zoom things and we weren't really ready to have more church conversations on Zoom. But in the past, we have had more educational groups, probably not enough, but I, I think we have to look a little bit at what COVID has done as far as really depending on John for our education. Mm -hmm. so let me jump in here. Uh, it's, it's a couple minutes after nine, and I'm so grateful to all of you for hanging in. Tom, thank you. You've done a, a beautiful job for us. This is enormously helpful. Uh, it's so good to hear the, the depth and uh, breadth of your experience. It's just a, a gift and a blessing to have you in our corner, and I'm very grateful to you. And mm -hmm. grateful to all of you for hanging in for this two hours of really substantive conversation. Betsy, I wonder if I could put you on the line to bless us uh, with a, a closing word. Sure, John, it, uh, I would be happy to. Please pray with me. Lord God, we are so grateful for the opportunity to hear from all of the members of our congregation, to hear their voices so that they will help guide us as we move forward in so many ways. Thank you for, uh, for Tom's insightful uh, reactions to everything that he's, he's given to us. Thank you for his expertise and for his ability to help us navigate what is a, he, uh, he said at first, it was the fire hose of information, but it was, uh, we're so grateful to him. Please help us learn how to deal with this and, and take this information in a positive way so that we can better serve not only our congregation, but our local community. And then perhaps once we get there, the, uh, the world at large. Guard us and guide us in all we are and all we say and all we do. We ask for your blessings and we ask all of this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen.